Experience the life-changing benefits of automated insulin delivery with the T-Slim X2 Insulin Pump from Tandem Diabetes Care. Snack while you meal prep. Doze off on the couch. Wear it fashionably or discreetly. You can do it all with the number one rated automated insulin delivery system according to a DQ&A patient panel. Get started at TandemDiabetes.com. Rx only, indicated for patients with type 1 diabetes 6 years and older. Warning, Control IQ technology should not be used by people under age 6 or who use less than 10 units of insulin per day or who weigh less than 55 pounds. Safety info available at TandemDiabetes.com slash safety info. You're listening to a CNA podcast. On 23rd of September, over 1,400 people gathered at the SG Climate Rally in Singapore, calling for climate justice. This year's rally was to really get people to understand that climate change will impact people unevenly, and that should be something that we account for when we are thinking of how we mitigate and adapt to climate change. And if any of you are in the crowd here listening to this speech, or later on to game in, to run, and you feel powerless to do anything, know that we cannot make a difference alone, but find a community, and together we can. It was the first in-person climate gathering to be held in Singapore since the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Environmental groups, politicians, and civil society groups came together in support of the initiative calling for change. When do we want it? Hi, I'm Julie Yu, and on this episode of the Climate Conversations, I want to look at the state of climate activism in Singapore and the strides the SG Climate Rally has made since its inception in 2019. Joining me today is Tan Heng Ying the co-organizer of the rally. Hi, Hanging. Welcome back to the show. I believe we last had you on in 2020, also talking about SG Climate Rally. So this time around, what were some highlights for you? Some highlights was definitely, for me personally, being back in Hong Lim Park after three long years and being able to gather in community and to be physically in the presence of people you know are fighting the same good fight Mm. and have the same dreams of a better and more livable and more just future, that to me felt really empowering. Mm. I will say nothing can quite compare to the feeling of gathering in person at Hong Lim Park. Mm. And I think a couple of other highlights for me was to see how much the movement has grown. One new thing that we brought to the 2023 rally that we didn't see at the 2019 rally Mm was we featured 12 different community organizations and bringing those partnerships and that solidarity into that space to me was really special. Mm. We had community partners from people working in labor issues to people from our indigenous Orang Pulau communities to people working specifically on the haze Mm. to help diversify the sort of voices and the different types of ways to work on climate justice Mm -hmm. that we get to talk about in one short afternoon. Mm -hmm. I think we also saw that with the profile of speakers that we managed to bring on board. Mm -hmm. One of the speeches that resonated with me the most deeply was our final speaker, Marlena. So Marlena is a rental flat resident and also a community worker. Mm -hmm. We first connected with her to understand how the climate crisis is impacting the most vulnerable in Singapore and specifically how lower income households and families were experiencing climate change. Mm. And I think she communicated that so clearly in her speech, right? I think there was this one line where the crowd cheered really loudly for where she managed to highlight a gender inequity in how climate change is being experienced. She said, when the weather gets really hot, men get to take off their shirts to cool off. But is that something that us women can do? is not an angle that I personally have thought about. There's a lot to lay on there in terms of perhaps culture, religion. Mm. And I think she managed to communicate all of that so powerfully. And I'm really grateful that the crowd got to learn from her. I wonder how different it was compared to last physical rally that was about four years ago. I think a lot was different. I think we, as the organizing team, went in with a lot more context and knowledge around what it means to work for climate justice in Singapore than we did in 2019, where it was a kind of hurried three-month effort to Mm. pull something together and to really capitalize on the immense amount of anger and grief that we were feeling globally, Mm. given that 2019 was the year of the climate strikes. It was the year that The UN had just put out their most damning IPCC report, Mm. whereas for this rally, we've had the past three years to 
think a lot more deeply and broadly to continue mobilizing in Singapore and to apply those learnings and wisdom into what then happened in the 2023 rally. Okay. I think another point of difference was that we wanted to pivot away from a lot of the grief and anger that was being felt in 2019 and focus on mm. a more empowering and action-oriented takeaway for our participants or for those who came to the rally. Is there a reason for that from that emotion? No, that's a great question. I think that anger for me personally has been incredibly empowering and constructive. It has driven a lot of the activism and advocacy that I've found myself in over years. But I think anger alone is not sustainable for everyone. Mm. I think that some people are able to thrive and feel empowered, but I think this is not necessarily the case for the majority of the population. And I think relying on anger alone for me would result in burnout. Mm. I've had to evolve this anger into other emotions motivating my activism, whether that has been a deep sense of love and care for the community that I organize with or the pockets of nature that remain or a belief that we can and have to do better for our children and for generations to come. When you said less anger, I thought, oh, is it because there have been notable progress and demands. I mean, since the first rally in 2019, where demonstrators, including yourself, you've urged the government to take bold and systemic climate action, what's changed? I think we're really heartened for sure to see that some of our demands or calls to action have definitely been met. Mm. Some of the most significant ones, I would say, is the raising of Singapore's climate ambition in terms of our net zero emissions target. Mm. Uh, back in 2019, we were aiming for 2100 to hit our net zero emissions. Mm -hmm. But the global recommendation coming out of the United Nations was that all countries needed to be hitting our net zero emissions target by 2050. Mm -hmm. So that was a big ask from our 2019 rally. And I think we're so heartened to see that Singapore has indeed improved our climate ambition mm -hmm. and changed our net zero emissions target to 2050 in line with global recommendations. Mm -hmm. Some other changes that we've seen would be the raising of the carbon tax. Yeah. I believe in 2019, it was something like $5 per ton, which is, again, grossly insufficient. Mm -hmm. And since then, the government has A, raised the carbon tax, but also B, made commitments to more progressively increase the carbon tax over the next couple of years. So those are some wins. But there's more to do. So we're recognizing that the impacts of the climate crisis are being disproportionately borne by those who had, were the least responsible for putting carbon emissions into our atmosphere. Mm. And that plays out within Singapore. If you look at, for example, workers who are toiling under the hot sun, who are earning the least but doing so much essential work, mm. who are then at the most risk for heat stroke, if you look at our low-income communities and how most rental flats actually don't come with air conditioning units installed when they arguably lead one of the lowest carbon lifestyles in Singapore because consumption is very much correlated then with how much emissions you're putting out, right? Mm -hmm. We've also been learning as a movement a lot more about Singapore's impact regionally and globally as a financial hub for the region with a number of our local banks still financing fossil fuel coal projects in the region with the sort of sand mining that we're doing from other Southeast Asian countries in order to build up Singapore's coastal defenses to protect Singapore against rising sea levels, but at the cost of eroding riverine communities across Southeast Asia. Mm. These are just some instances for us of how climate injustice can continue to play out even as we try to take some firmer action on climate change. And I think that is driving a lot of the impetus for continued advocacy and activism. Hello, my name is Steve Lai. And I'm Teresa Tang. And we are the hosts of CNA Correspondent. A podcast that takes you to the heart of the work our correspondents do across the globe. From China's COVID response to the child care center massacre in Thailand. And from the fall of Najib Razak to the rise of Anwar Ibrahim as Malaysia's prime minister. 
We speak to the people at the reporting front lines. So if you want to know how the biggest global stories unfold, make sure you follow or subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. So you are calling for green and justice to go hand in hand. So what are the alternatives? What are the solutions? That's a great question. And I will say that we have produced a very extensive policy recommendations document. Mm. So broadly, we're putting forth a just and inclusive roadmap like A, improving our climate ambition. So accelerating the transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. Mm. B, a far more rigorous protection of our current ecosystems and nature spaces. Mm. And C, is that we need to empower the people further to be able to drive our climate mitigation and adaptation pathways. The last point is very interesting, empowering people. What would be the best way to empower people? That's one way of thinking about it. We're calling for a meaningful engagement of low-income communities and the broader public in terms of how these climate consultations and climate conversations are being had. Mm. We believe strongly that we need to take a non-technocratic approach to building Singapore's net zero pathway, which means that the public must be extensively consulted. You know, our blue collar workers, our low income communities, migrant workers. Mm. So some of the more concrete policy asks that we're putting across could be something as simple as ensuring a longer lead time for public consultations for, of at least two months when the public is being invited to give feedback on certain climate and environmental policies. How can we ensure that as many people as possible know about these public consultation efforts and are able to give their feedback beyond having closed all consultations? How are we making mm. the feedback gathered from these consultations available to the general public such that all Singaporeans are able to weigh in? Yeah. I think empowering the people also looks like ensuring that our uh, low-income communities are being protected against the rising cost of living. Mm. One big fear around talking about climate change is how is it going to impact our daily lives, right? Are you asking me to, you know, give up my daily conveniences and pay more for renewable energy over fossil fuels? And I think that's definitely not the case. Mm. We want to debunk the myth that you know, cost of living and bread and butter issues come at the cost of protecting the climate. And there's so many ways that this can happen. For example, ensuring that the dividends earned from our carbon tax collection is being fed back into low income households in a more regular and sustained way through carbon vouchers and rebates and ensuring a progressive deployment of these rebates such that low-income households really benefit. Mm. I think another piece around empowering the people is jobs. We do have a portion of a worker population who are still working in sunset industries such as oil and gas and the petrochemical sector in Singapore. We're not asking for them to be put out of work. We're asking for them to be upskilled and transitioned into the green sector that will inevitably be the future that we need to move towards. It seems like you're really combining climate change discussion with other forms of injustice like social and economic issues as well, rather than just pigeonholing it into an environment issue. That might make sense when it comes to drawing more people into the conversation, but has that approach Born fruit? Has it worked? I think that is difficult to answer at this point. I think this sort of organizing strategy is a deeply long-term one because to build meaningful solidarity with communities, that takes years, right? Mm. We've seen people from different communities, such as the rider community, the worker community, the rental flat community, show up for the 2023 rally in a way that I don't think we drew those populations back in 2019. Mm. So I think it's slow and steady and long-term work. Okay, But for us, it is a question also of ideology and strategy that this is the important coalition building work that we have to do to ensure that the transition into a green and just economy is one that brings everyone along and not just certain population. But how would you address those who worry such an approach of conflating all these issues would get too confusing or might risk discouraging engagement on climate change? I think that risk is there, but I think that is then the difficult and meaningful work for us doing this climate justice work to try and make these connections as clear and accessible as possible. I think we 
fundamentally believe that these connections exist, but we have not been educated to understand how they're there. I think these are not at all mainstream narratives, but for us, this is the truth of the matter, is that the climate crisis is a deeply complex one and is not as simple as saying there are a couple of factories that are emitting greenhouse gases and that is what we must shut down. Absolutely. I think the reality of the climate crisis is that it is fundamentally such a systemic and structural issue that ties into our economic systems, our financial systems. Mm. All of that is interconnected and that is the difficult what we have to do as activists to make those connections clear to people. On that issue of delivering climate justice, a recent report by the UN Environment Program says lawsuits challenging government and corporate inaction on climate change. The majority of cases are still in the U.S., where we saw that landmark constitutional trial brought by in a group of young people against Montana. But would you agree? I think the novelty and the kind of visual impact of children suing governments and corporations for their future is a really, really powerful one, right? And it means that people will talk about it. It means that the climate crisis is in public discourse and is on the national agenda. Mm. I think it remains to be seen what the concrete impact of winning such a lawsuit would look like. Mm. My personal fear is that to bring the climate fight into the legislative space also opens up the space for fossil fuel companies and dirty corporations to do the same. They now also have access to the same legal tools and are also able to open up, you know, this new arena of lawsuits, perhaps against communities that are just fighting to protect their livelihoods. That's a very interesting take. Mm. I personally am fully behind the children and communities who are taking to the courts to ask those in power for their future back. I fully support that, but I would say that that alone is not enough and we need to continue the many other diverse forms of strategies and tactics for the fight for climate justice. All of that needs to continue, right? Some studies show that people often resonate more with solutions. How frequently do you discuss tangible solutions and ideas in your activism? And do you believe raising questions is enough? That is something that we do talk about a lot within the movement is to what extent does actually Climate Rally as a ground up, youth led, completely volunteer run movement, to what extent are we responsible for producing very technical or deeply complex solutions of the climate crisis? Mm. And I think we try to straddle that balance. I agree with you that Mm -hmm. to simply talk about extent of how bad the crisis is, is often disempowering for people. They just feel that they don't know where to start. Like, can I do anything at all? And I think being able to offer examples of how change has happened and what solutions can look like is to offer hope. And I think that hope is so crucial in keeping people invested in change making and taking action at all. Mm -hmm. That said, I think the responsibility also needs to be borne by those in power to put resources into developing these solutions in a deeply holistic and comprehensive way, right? They have the resources to hire climate scientists, host public consultations to ensure that feedback is being gotten at all levels from all communities and to fold all of that into climate solutions. There is only so much that completely volunteer-run activist movements are able to do. So I, I would say it's a bit of an interesting balance to try and strike where For me personally, it is a big chunk of the government's job to figure out what the very complex solutions taking us out of the climate crisis will look like in a way that will protect the most vulnerable. That is a question we constantly discuss. As we wrap up the show, climate change affects everybody, yet many feel overwhelmed, feel jaded sometimes, disconnected from the discussion. What sort of message do you have for ordinary citizens who want to make a difference but just don't know where to start? My one piece of advice would be what has personally worked for me, which is just to get involved with any group that is larger than yourself. Mm. I think often a lot of the narratives around how to take action around climate change has, over the past few decades, been too focused on what we can do within our individual lifestyles. So for example, use less single-use plastic, stop using straws, bring reusable bags, eat a plant-based or local diet, 
fly less. Mm. And all of these things are really important. But I would also argue that that is not enough. Mm. And the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. For me, being a part of Ashley Climate Rally has really helped me understand is that we achieve so much more together as a group in collective action than we can possibly as an individual. I could not have kept going if I was just alone trying to make change myself. But in getting involved with a group beyond me is how you will create an outsized impact and how you will find it in you to keep going. Mm -hmm. That's what has worked for me. And I would highly, highly, highly encourage everyone to do the same. Yeah. Thank you so much for that reminder. And actually, this conversation reminded me of the words of Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Exactly. So, Heng Yang, I really appreciate your time, your insight, and your passion with us today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks to my guest, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, do remember to like and subscribe to this podcast so you know when the new episode drops. Leave us a message on Spotify or Apple Podcasts to let us know what you think. The team behind this podcast is Cyan Nguyen, Jacqueline Chen, Joanne Chen, Tiffany Ang, Crispina Robert, and Nam Julie Yu, signing off. Evolving education for a changing world. Expand your career opportunities and earn an MBA from University of Cincinnati Online Lindner College of Business. Designed for busy professionals, UC Online MBA is flexible, personalized, and supports students from application all the way through graduation. Get the world-class degree you deserve without sacrificing work or family commitments. Apply now at online.uc.edu/mba.